Hello, and welcome to episode 36 of the Talk Witchcraft podcast. In this episode, Maggie and I will be talking about perfectionism and criticism. You're listening to Talk Witchcraft. On this podcast, we talk about witchcraft as a lifestyle and discover how to merge magic into your daily life. Every week, we'll demystify witchy topics like tarot, astrology, crystals, herbs, and more as you develop your personal brand of magic and create the life of your dreams. We're We're your your hosts, hosts, the Mystic Mystic Sisters, Sisters, Erica and Maggie. In this segment of the show, we choose a tarot card for the week, and we look for moments that relate to this card in our daily lives. So for this episode, we chose the Ten of Pentacles. The theme of this card is excess in terms of wealth and opulence. So we can see the first generation has accumulated so much wealth and physical possessions that they can now pass that on to their children and even their grandchildren. I tend to think of the 10 cards as like an epilogue to the story. They wrap up everything and prepare you to say goodbye to the characters as they embark on the next phase of their story. And with the 10 of pentacles, we see that the story of the older generation is ending and the story picks up with the next generation. What's your story about the 10 of pentacles? So in the previous episode, I think it was the eight of pentacles. We talked about the journey of the journeyman. So we had like the, the apprentice in the seven of pentacles and then the eight of pentacles was the journeyman. And then the nine of pentacles was the master. And so if we follow that progression, the 10 of pentacles could be like the person who has an excess of knowledge on a topic and has developed those skills in creating something and they're passing that on. So for me, this kind of feels like passing on my knowledge of wiz- of witchcraft and my knowledge of of everything I've learned as I've been practicing and passing it on through, you know, this podcast and through um, Mumbles Academy, our blog and everything that we've created for for Mumbles and things. So that's kind of what I feel like with this card is just thinking about developing the skills through practice, developing the knowledge through reading and learning and things like that. And then at this point, I feel like I can share that and teach that to other people. Yeah. And mine's similar in a way. Um, You know, I've gotten to a place in my life where um, my new job has me supervising SLPA um, workers, SLP assistants, and they are um, bachelor's level to my master's level. So, you know, they, they're capable of doing the therapy, they've learned enough to carry out the activities and the skills. And I'm just that step above with the master of the nine of pentacles of being able to test and analyze data and create plans of care that my assistants can carry out. And then, so my 10 of pentacles for that is that now I'm in a role of supervision and teaching and passing on my knowledge to um, workers, providers who are younger than me or younger in terms of skills and in terms of experience in the field, because I do work with some women who are my same age or older than me. Um, But I'm able to help them when they need it. If they have questions, they can ask me. And so it's, it's just that next little bump above, um, you know, I've, I've learned all the skills for myself and now I'm passing them on to other people. Yeah. So, I mean, we're going a little bit of a different take than what this card traditionally represents, thinking about it in terms of teaching and things like that and passing it on. Um, Usually the card, you know, is representative of wealth, but this is, that goes along with the idea of the pentacles are not always about money. They're about the physical world in general. So we have these skills that we can pass on as well um, in the same way that you might pass on an inheritance. Right. Yeah. And I, I like to think, you know, as you said, the pentacles traditionally represent money, but, um, you know, we have a wealth of knowledge. We have a wealth of skills and, um, So if you think about wealth and 
the tangible object or the the thing that you can give to somebody that's what the pe- pentacles represents so now should we move on to our topic for the week yes so as Erica said at the beginning of the show, we are talking about overcoming perfectionism and the idea of criticism, especially in terms of self-critique. Um, now, we've definitely talked about perfectionism before on this podcast. It's often something that comes up for me when we talk about the moon phase. And in the Virgo season episode, we talked a little bit about perfectionism, but we haven't really talked that much about what we mean by that word. And so let's just go ahead and share what perfectionism is. Perfectionism is the feeling that you want to avoid a task because you feel like you'll mess it up or do it at the wrong time or in the wrong way. And it's a desire to learn how to do something, but never actually putting it in the time to learn because you don't want to do it wrong. Right. So perfectionism can also be about being critical about yourself and what you're capable of. It's like when you think you can't do something because you don't think you're worthy or you don't think you have the right knowledge or skills or the you know physical capability to do that thing. Yeah, and you know also perfectionism could look like overworking and trying to prove yourself. Uh, I think of Hermione Granger in this in this case, she has these insecurities about being muggle-born. So she works extra hard to prove that she's just as good, if not better than the witches and wizards that grew up in their magical households. Yeah, exactly. Or you you might even think of like Leslie Note from Parks and Rec, who is like a huge overachiever. And it seems like she's just like perfect at everything. But I do wonder if that if that's like a feeling of feel of being insecure about, you know, being a woman in government and things like that and wanting to do better than the men she's surrounded with. Mm -hmm. So in terms of witchcraft, this might look like not casting a spell because it's the wrong day. Like it's not Saturday, so I can't do a banishment spell or it's the wrong moon phase. If you wanted to attract something and it's a waning moon, or if you don't have the right tools or materials, or just you think you aren't good enough or haven't learned enough. So at the same time, it's not wanting to learn those things because learn a new practice or learn a new method because learning usually involves trying something new or doing something until, and sometimes that means doing it improperly until you've learned how to do it properly. So, you know, until you get the hang of it. Mm -hmm. So Erica and I have both struggled with perfectionism and I think we're both still working on getting over it. It's an, it's a long-term, probably lifelong thing that many people work on, but we do have some tips that we want to share with you about how we've released some of that tension that builds up when perfectionism enters the room. But first, this episode is brought to you by Red Clover. I will start by telling you about the medicinal properties and then Maggie will share the magical properties. Red Clover is a fun little plant. Whenever I think of red clover, I think of the scene in Bambi when Thumper and his family are eating the clover and he is always eating just the flowers and mom and the mom chastised him then says that he needs to eat the greens too. Like that's what I think of when I think of red clover. Thumper is not wrong. We do like to use the purple pink petals in our concoctions, but we also want to use the roots and the little leaflets that come at the base of the flower. Red clover is also one of the first things that blooms in the spring. And so because of that, they are like dandelions in that the bees are usually getting their nectar after the long winter. So you don't want to pick them until one to two weeks after that first bloom just so that the bees can have a chance at them first. And also it gives the plant some time to really ground itself and get going for the springtime. And if you do that and you wait, then they can be harvested up to three times in a year. I know it's very exciting when the clover starts to bloom, but give, give them a minute and they'll, they'll serve you well for the rest of the blooming season. So they're really good for blood purifications. A lot of cancer patients use them after they're done with chemotherapy because it helps to get uh, rid of some of that excess 
radiation and chemicals in their blood. It's a great for detoxing and cleansing because it is a blood thinner. Uh, you want to be careful with any blood thinning medications you may on, and you should not use it at all if you have a blood clotting disorder. So always check with your physician before starting any herbs. It's also really good for phlegm in the lungs and wet coughs. Um, it can be used as a nourishing tonic. We call it, it's a spring tonic. It's got tons of vitamins and minerals. You can just use it. You know, I, I think of the old tiny old lady saying, oh, I got to drink my tonic. Like that's what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also really good for hormone balancing, especially for um, women going through menopause. So the way that you can uh, take these herbs is either in a tea or in a tincture. So as for the magical uses of red clover, it corresponds with active energy the planets Mercury and Venus, the zodiac sign Virgo, and the elements of earth and air can be added to spells for loyalty, love, increasing money, attracting money, protection, and blessing domestic animals, whether that's on a farm or your pets in your home. And so a couple of ways you can try using red clover is to carry the flower when you are entering into some sort of financial agreement, like if you're going in to rent an apartment or lease a car, or if you are going into the bank to borrow money or anything like that, carrying red clover with you can help to encourage a good relationship between both parties. You can also sprinkle it around your home to cleanse the home of any sort of stagnant energy that you don't want. Red clover is not the clover that has the four leaves that we think about associated with luck. That's the white clover, I believe, but it is still associated with luck. So you can carry the leaves with you as a way to promote good luck, especially in attracting love or new friendships to you. It has a lot of different uses. You can make an infusion of the leaves or the flowers and, and uh, use it for washing your floor or washing your doors, again, for cleansing of any sort of stagnant energy, adding protection to your home and things like that. And it can it's a really good herb for bundling and making into like a, a herbal bundle for smoke cleansing. So you can light it and then carry it around your home and cleanse the space. Now back to our regularly scheduled podcast where we are talking about perfectionism. And now we'll share our ideas for how we overcome perfectionism in our lives. So the first thing is that done is better than perfect. So whenever I feel like I'm slipping into perfectionism, I just repeat to myself, done is better than perfect. And, you know, I want to take a minute to do the thing rather than hold it off forever because of this like abstract idea of perfection. I had a professor who used to say anything do worth doing is worth doing badly. And it's kind of a interesting way to look at the world because it's saying done is better than perfect. And so doing one yoga pose is better than not doing any yoga pose, not going through the whole rigmarole of cutting up all the vegetables just perfectly and just kind of doing it sloppily is better than not cutting up any vegetables. Um, eating, eating a whole celery right off of the stalk is better than instead of just cutting it up into bite-sized pieces is better than not eating the celery. So anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Yeah, I was thinking about because I think you shared that story about how you're doing, you're trying to make sure you do one yoga pose a day. And that's your like, goal. Um, mm -hmm. Because in it that fits in with this, it's like, doing that one thing is better than not doing it at all mm -hmm. for you to reach that goal. Yeah. I like that turn of phrase because the original phrase is anything worth doing is worth doing well, but to turn it around and say it's worth doing it badly. Um, I, re I remember when I was writing the, my book, it was like so hard because that's what I struggle with with writing is I want it to be perfect <laughs> when I when it comes out of my fingers into the keyboard and onto the page. But 
with writing, it's a process. You have to like get all your thoughts out first and then organize them so that they make sense. And so it's going to be done badly first (laughs) before it makes any sense. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm working right now on last year, I went through this process of making digital materials for speech therapy. So all of my kids who were doing teletherapy could access my services. And now that I'm back in person, having them digital doesn't make any sense anymore. And it's so much better to have a physical material. And so I've been spending probably all summer working on making these materials that I spent all last year making digital now, printing them out and making them physical. And it's been a long process and it's going to continue to be a long process. And, you know, I, I come up with new and different ways to make the process easier as I go along, which means that the materials that I made before don't have the same components to it, but I'm trying to keep everything pretty streamlined. One of the things that I totally gave up on was cutting on the lines. Like I have a, I have a paper cutter that does the straight lines. And I spent so much time trying to get the blade to line up exactly on the line. And now I'm like, I don't care about that. That is not important to me. And (laughs) so sometimes they're on the lines and sometimes they're a little crooked, but it's okay because I have the material. So I was also thinking about, you know, my husband, Dana (laughs) and I, we just celebrated our two year anniversary in August. And our first dance at our wedding was, is this song, um, if we were vampires by Jason Isbell. And the premise of it is that, you know, we're not immortal. We're human. We are mortals. But if we were, then life and love wouldn't be as meaningful. They wouldn't matter as much. So it talks about all these things you might do if you lived forever. And then that life and love basically are are a gift. And the fact that eventually we die is a gift because it makes it so that we want to enjoy each moment. So it's a little bit morbid, but we, we really liked the idea of it and that's why we chose it. But anyway, as we were thinking about that and celebrating our anniversary, we decided that we were going to get ourselves Apple watches as like our anniversary gift to ourselves so that we can um, motivate ourselves to take better care of our bodies so that even if we can't be together for eternity, since we can't, we are going to be healthy together as long as we can. So anyway, the reason I bring all that up is because the Apple watch has this feature where you complete your rings. And so there's these goals that you set for yourself. And um, it's about like how much energy you use in a day, how many times you stand up in a day, and how much exercise you get in a day. And if I were being a perfectionist about it, I would set those to be pretty high. But I also know that if I had done that, like when I was setting my goals, if I had set them to the actual goal that I want, then it would be demotivating to me because I wouldn't, I would know that it's going to be really hard to do that. (laughs) So I'm just not going to do it at all. So instead I set my goals a lot lower, something that was like something I already, it's just a bit beyond what I already do. And then I found that because of that, when my goals, when my rings are already complete, it makes me want to do more. Like I'm going to do it even better. (laughs) Um, So that's motivating to me because once it's done, that's better than perfect. (laughs) Right. Also, that wasn't an ad. Right. We're (laughs) Apple watch sponsor (laughs) us. But anyway, that was just, I think that that was a, a good thing for me to realize about myself is as a perfectionist, I would have wanted it something, you know, higher, but yeah. Cause if you set the bar low, then you can achieve it and excel. It's that, you know, don't shoot for the moon, shoot for the stars or what is it? Shoot for the moon. Cause if you fail, you'll land in the stars. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> so it's not exactly what I wanted to say, but you know, like Give, give yourself a little bit of wiggle room to meet the goal that you know that you can do, but if you don't, you've still met your goal. Yeah, exactly. And this is probably, I mean, if you're neuro, if you're neurotypical and you're listening to this, this is probably like not the right advice because, um, you know, a lot of people really need those high goals to motivate them to reach it. But for someone like 
us with ADHD, we have low executive function. So it's, it's so just having enough motivation to get to those low goals is hard. <laughs> so, um, you know, every, everyone has their own thing, but this is what works for us. <laughs> and, you know, th- that's why there's things like stretch goals and, you know, like there's, there's the goal that you want. And then there's the goal that you probably can achieve, which is lower. And then there's the stretch goal that's up above what you want. And, and so like when, when I make a goal, I always have those three qualifiers in mind. So my, my goal for yoga would be to do a full routine of like 20 minutes. My actual goal is to just do one pose and my stretch goal is to do an hour of yoga. So there's those three levels of achievement so that you can always be successful at something. Yeah. Landing among the stars. (laughs) Yes. Land among the stars, which leads us to our second thing, which is reframe your expectations. So in the world of beautiful Instagram feeds and Pinterest boards, it's easy to feel like our practice is not good enough, but spirituality is not about the aesthetic. It's meant to support you and empower you and sustain you. And so if it's stressing out you out to try and make it look a certain way, it's not worth it. Um, So this is sort of another cliche phrase, but don't let perfect be the enemy of good. If you're feeling stressed out about your, your spiritual practice, because you're not, you don't feel like you're doing enough or, or you have to do the spell at the exact right time in the right day and all of that, then, you know, take a step back. That's always a good idea for like anything when you feel stressed out is to just take a step back and look at the situation sort of objectively and think about why you want it to be perfect. Like what's the benefit of perfection? Will you gain something from it being perfect? What happens if it's not perfect? Is it going to be that bad if it's not perfect? And if it was just good or just good, you know, um, and is there something that you can gain from just being good (laughs) or bad? Like we were talking about before doing what, what is there a benefit of just doing it badly? (laughs) I, so I had a blessed five day weekend because I don't work on Thursdays. And then my clinic was closed for Labor Day for Friday and Monday. So I had this expectation in my brain of, I need to pack my weekend full of things that I don't get to do throughout my regular work week. You know, I've been lamenting not having enough time for hobbies and for reading and for doing fun things. And so I kind of made myself a schedule so that I could hold myself accountable. And it was just the way that I looked at it was it was a um, not so much a rule book, but a set of guidelines. If you want to quote Pirates of the Caribbean, it was it was things to give me ideas for what I could do in my time so that I wasn't just sitting on the couch scrolling through Facebook or TikTok or playing phone games, but I was actually doing things. And I got to one of my activities that I had planned for myself, which was to work on my miniature house things that I love to do and to um, study my herbalism stuff. And I went upstairs to my craft table and I sat down and I was like, man, I do not want to do this right now. This isn't, I am not motivated to do this right now. And I could have gone the perfectionism route and said like, no, it's time to do it. This is what I scheduled myself for. I have to do it. And I would not have enjoyed it and it wouldn't have been fun. And I probably wouldn't have done it well. And I said, the thing that I really want to do is I just want to sit on the couch and watch more Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because that was what I had been doing previously. And I hadn't quite left that mindset yet. And so it's okay. It's okay to let go of the plan and do something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like what, something that you'll actually get something out of because you didn't force yourself to do something that you didn't want to (laughs) do. Exactly. And as humans, we aren't perfect. That's kind of part of our charm that we are imperfect. We, the way we work is we try something and if it works, that's awesome. If it doesn't, we Um, we learn from that. We learn from what didn't work. We adjust ourselves and then we try it again. 
and maybe we learn that that's not for us and we don't do it. That's okay too. But if, but if it's something you want to keep learning, then you try again until you learn it. And that's how you learn a new witchcraft practice or, you know, like learning how to read the tarot or any other divination practice or how you learn to use crystals or how you learn herbalism or anything like that. And that's re what's really amazing about witchcraft is that, um, well, unless you follow like an orthopraxic pa practice or tradition, there's no right or wrong way to practice and there's no right or wrong way to do things. So as you're trying new things and learning and following your interests in witchcraft or whatever, then you add your own flavor and your own style to it based on you know, what you're motivated by and what makes you feel um, sustained and supported and uh, helps you feel whole and healed. Now, perfectionism often leads to criticism, especially self-criticism. That's basically what perfectionism is, is critiquing yourself and thinking you're not good enough or you haven't learned about, as we mentioned. Yes. And no one is immune to negative self-talk. Everyone has something they don't like in their personalities or in their looks, but don't let it dominate your thoughts or prevent you from taking action. When you expect yourself to be perfect and are so critical of yourself, you create resistance. So one thing you can do is to become aware of when you are being hard on yourself. And this is done through mindful meditation where you're very aware of your own thoughts. We have, you know, I think the number is 60,000 thoughts per day. So it's hard to be aware of every single one of them, but when you do notice that you have some sort of negative self-talk happening or things that you're being really critical of yourself, being mindful of that. And I've actually taken it a step further where I have named my negative self-talk persona. Her name is Laurel. And if I notice that Laurel is being really mean or saying things that are untrue about me, then I just tell her she's hurting my feelings. And that's, an, that's usually enough. Like if you said to somebody in real life, that they're hurting your feelings, then usually they'll stop if they're a nice person. So saying it to my mean persona usually works. Yeah. I just call mine the gremlin. <laughs> That's a good one too. <laughs> Go away, gremlin. <laughs> Don't pour water on it. Yeah. I, I tell myself like my gremlin is talking to me or is yelling at me and it kind of just takes it out of this brain place and puts it into the physical world of being able to tell yourself like, this isn't true. <laughs> and none of this is real. And Laurel, you're being mean or gremlin go away. Cause you're not being nice to me right now. Being a neurodivergent person, it's important. We felt to talk about when that we are especially susceptible to taking criticism to our heart when it comes from an external source or from our own brains. And this is called rejection sensitivity dysphoria or RSV. And it feels like real criticism, although it is almost always imagined, but that doesn't make it feel any less. Yeah. When I, when I experience RSD, it's like, my heart is like, literally breaking. Like, I feel like my heart is beating so fast and I get really sweaty and embarrassed. Like whether it's coming, whether I feel like it's coming from someone else toward me or my own brain is saying it to me, but usually I just have to say that it out loud. I'm a Gemini. So I have to talk things through, um, and communicate through like verbalizing things, but it's like what you said with your gremlins. When I say it out loud, it kind of takes it, it's hard to explain it to somebody else. And that makes it not seem logical. That makes it seem, and I mean, logic and emotions that they don't really go together all, anyway. But if you're trying to explain your emotions and you can't really explain why you're feeling a certain way, it makes it so that it doesn't hurt as much. It makes it so that it's like, oh, this is actually not real. Right. And I had a thought and it's gone. ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll come back if I give it a minute. Oh, yes, I got it. Okay. So what I do is I, when I'm feeling like I'm being told that I'm awful and bad and terrible and the world hates me is I usually go and do something that makes me feel good. For me, 
going and playing the piano is better than going and talking to a counselor. And I don't know why, and I can't explain it, but I go and I sit down on the, at the piano and I play through the entire Titanic book of music. And then I'm, I'm fine. The world is happy again. And I, I don't know why, and I could never be able to explain it, but it works. And so find something that works for you. That is similar to that. Yeah. Something that makes you recognize that that's not necessarily true. Um, Another idea is to find evidence that it's not true. Like if you are feeling like the world hates you and everyone's mad at you, find a person who's not mad at you (laughs) and and prove to yourself that it's not everybody. Like maybe you can't prove it's one specific person, but you can prove that it's, you know, you've blown it out of proportion a little bit. And all of this isn't to diminish those feelings because again, it's a very real painful feeling when you experience this criticism whether it's imagined or not. So it's, it's not to diminish it or make it seem un, invalid. It's just to give you strategies for, you know, getting out of that headspace um, so you don't feel that pain anymore. Yeah. And, and there is something to be said for valid criticism. You know, we, we always get our work critiqued, all of our actions are critiqued. And when somebody has a suggestion, it's, it's good to be able to learn how to take those suggestions. And so it's like, for me, I told my boss just straight up, like, I'm a crier. If you need to criticize my work, or you need to tell me something that's going wrong and how they, you want me to do it better. I understand that that needs to happen and I'm going to cry and it's not because I'm upset and it's not because I think you're wrong or I'm hurt or anything like that. Sometimes it's because I'm hurt. It's just because that's how I process it and telling her that and advocating for myself, let her know that if that were to come up, it's not like she won't be shocked by it. She won't be taken aback by it. And so it's really, it is important for you to be able to say those things that you do and that you need. And she asked me a follow-up question of, um, well, what would be better um, for me to do if I need to criticize? And we talked about the, the compliment sandwich of, I like how you're doing this. I need you to work on this, but this is also really good. And then, and you know, that doesn't always work the other thing that's important for me is I hate not having resolution. So emails like, Hey, I need to talk with you on Monday morning are horrible and send me into a tailspin. And then I make it out to be worst case scenario. So I told her like, if you need to talk to me, you need to send me the email that says, Hey, I need to talk with you about this. I have a question. Let's chat on Monday. And then I know what is coming. Yeah. So when you're, you know, thinking of what could go wrong, what are the worst case scenarios of that email? Instead, think of what could go right. Like at least give yourself both options that it might not be this terrible, awful thing. It could be this amazing thing. And usually it's probably somewhere like right in the middle or just like normal. (laughs) Or usually not even related to the things that I like. Yeah. I think the worst possible thing, I think the right most amazing thing. And it's usually not even related to either of those things. Right. So (laughs) if you're going to go into some kind of uh, tailspin of it could be this worst thing, also go into a tailspin to the best possible thing (laughs) and just like look for things that you can appreciate and, and things that, and even, you know, if you're going into that place of this terrible thing, they think all these mean things about me and give yourself something to look forward to or something good that's happening right now in the meantime, (laughs) because, you know, like you said, going to play the piano or something like that, um, giving yourself something. It's almost like a distraction of the things that make you feel good. And as always, just be very compassionate with yourself. If you're feeling, if you're saying negative things about things you don't like about yourself, turn it around into something that you do like yourself or something that you're grateful for. So one thing that I always, or I have in the past, I've gotten over it, but I used to hate the way my voice sounds on recordings and it kept me from doing things for the longest time. I never wanted to record a video or do anything because I hated like editing it and hearing myself. (laughs) But 
instead of saying, oh, I don't like the way my voice sounds, I can say, oh, I'm so happy that I can express myself verbally. Sometimes it's hard when you're in that dark place of, I hate myself. It's hard to think of something that you do like about yourself. So remember when we were talking about perfectionism at the beginning of the podcast, you know, just doing a small thing, just thinking of one little thing that you like about yourself is better than being in that place of everything is about me is wrong. Yeah. And sometimes what's helpful for me when I'm feeling really down on myself is usually putting it on someone else that something someone else is, is in, it likes about me. So like for the cats, I keep them alive and like, like that's something that I can like about myself that I keep my cats alive. (laughs) You know, it's like someone else depends on me or something like that, or, you know, it's not necessarily something about me, but it's like the cats appreciate me because they get to eat. (laughs) (laughs) Or my boyfriend thinks I'm funny or my mom loves me or my dad loves me, you know, putting it on somebody else. Like we don't, we don't do things for people because we, we do do things for people because we like them. They wouldn't do those things for us if they didn't like something about us. So what do they like about me? And that maybe that's something I can like about myself. Yeah. It always comes back to that idea. Like a lot of these spiritual gurus will tell you that you can't love someone else or someone else won't love you until you love yourself. But I just, and I've said it before, but I just think that's BS because sometimes it's really hard to love yourself and having someone else love or, and like putting that on yourself that you can't be loved unless you love yourself is like so harmful um, because it's not even true. People love you when you don't love yourself. Yep. All the time. <laughs> I feel like this is like a very dark place to leave. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Long story short, (laughs) criticism exists, but we are, we can rise above it. Yes. Through all of these strategies, let's sum them up. We have, we can name our negative self-talk, make it sort of funny so that it feels a little bit silly. We can say our feelings out loud or do something that we like, say it, or, you know, express ourselves in some way. And just turn things around for whether you see the way someone else likes you or uh, something that you like about yourself. So now it is time to talk about our moon phase of the week. We are on a waxing gibbous moon growing toward a full moon. And the waxing gibbous is the growth. We're at like almost the peak of the bell curve. So the growth is slowing down. Um, at the start of the waxing gibbous, it's still kind of linear increase, and then it's leveling off to the peak at the full moon. So that means that you're also, you're kind of slowing down with your activities and just absorbing everything that you've attracted to you. So looking for what's come your way and kind of preparing for that celebration at the full moon. What does that mean for you? I do feel like I've slowed down a little bit. I feel like everything's kind of just sustaining itself right now. And it's it's in the autopilot kind of stage of things. And my I'm getting into the routine at work. I've got my 120-day probation meeting coming up on October 1st. So we'll talk about how things are going and, you know, where my next phase of this job is going to be. And it's in a holding pattern. So everything's just kind of, like you said, just kind of slow and steady right now. That's kind of the same with me. I feel like everything, I've gotten things figured out where I have a loose structure that actually works for me. Every time I try to do something like really rigid and schedule each minute of my day, if I miss it, it's like we've talked about before. If I miss something, it's like, okay, well, I don't have to do anything else ever again, (laughs) but I've given myself like a theme for the day and that is working for me a lot better. So I feel like things are just getting done and I'm doing what I need to do. And I feel like I know what to do instead of feeling kind of like lost and chaotic. (laughs) Now we want to hear from you. If you go to witchwanderer.com, you'll find the latest game. This week, we have a question for you. Do you have a name for your negative self-talk persona? Because we want to know. The sillier, the better. 
Next week, we are moving into Libra season. Our tarot card that we will be looking for in our day-to-day life for next week is the Queen of Swords. And this card is all about magnetism, being attractive and attracting things, optimism, being really self-assured and upbeat and positive. This person is dedicated to their task. They are friendly and easygoing. They are wholeheartedly involved in everything that they do. They're very creative, know where they're going, very have a good direction for everything that they do. And they are not undaunted. They are not undaunted. They are undaunted by a challenge. Can you be daunted? I think you can in Europe. I know you can be (laughs) over daunted and you can be under daunted, but can you ever just be daunted? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, so we'll be looking for a person like this, or if we've ever seen this in our own selves throughout the week. And If you have a story about the Queen of Swords that you want to share with us, send us an email at welisten at talkwitchcraft.com. You can find out more about this episode by going to mumblesandthings.com slash blog slash 036. Join us next week when we talk about how to make the most of Libra season. And make sure that you subscribe so that you are notified about each new episode. To help other witches find this show, leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram at Mumbles and Things and join us in the Mumble Academy to chat about this episode with other witchy folk. And yes, you can just be daunted. Uh, Bye-bye.